Take your copy of the Word of God and open it to Luke chapter 5. It's where I'm going to begin reading to you in just a few minutes. Luke chapter 5, we're going to begin at verse 37, looking into the words of our Savior Christ. It is the year 2023, the first day. And today I want to preach to you a message. You need new skins for a new year. You may not understand what that means yet, but you'll figure it out as we go along here today. Luke chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading verse 37 here in just a few minutes. It's kind of hard to believe that we've already come all the way through 2022, and here we are standing on the first day of a new year. I mean, things these days tend to change and come a little bit more rapidly. It just seems like things are moving at light speed. I want to remind you for just a second about how things used to be. In 1968, raise your hand if you were alive in 1968, by the way. We got several of you. Raise your hand if you were not alive in 1968. I'd call that a multi generational church. Praise the Lord. I love that. The young, the old, and everybody in between. 1968, kids wanted Barbie's Dream House and a light bright for Christmas. I had one of those light brights. I love that thing. This year, kids wanted an iPhone and a PS5. Things have changed just a little bit. In 1968, they tell us that the average price of gas was only 34 cents a gallon. Wouldn't that be nice? Today, the average price nationwide is $3.13 a gallon. I don't want to depress you, so I'm going to move on. In 1968, the average price of a new car, a new car, 1968, 2000 $822. According to Kelly Blue Book, the national average for a new car in 2022 and now coming into 2023 stands at over $48,000. That means that gas has gone up 10 times. That means that new cars have gone up 16 times over the course of that period of time. And then in 1968, the average price of a new house, what would you guess it would be? The average price of a new house, $25,000. Today, today, the average price for a new house, the sales price, not the listed price, but the actual sale price for the home, $471,200. That is 19 times more than in 1968. I would say to you that things have changed rapidly. Sometimes we get to thinking about those great prices and we get a little bit of it fascinated and fixated on the way that things used to be. We've got to be careful about that because we can neglect our present and we can miss our future. Let me say that again. We can sacrifice our present and our future on the altar of the past. Now, there's nothing wrong with things that we used to do and the way things used to be. In fact, in some ways, if we would go back and do the things that we used to do yesterday, maybe better nutrition or more exercise or a better attitude or more family time or whatever, that might all be good. But you know, sometimes looking into the past and yearning for days that have gone by can turn out to be very dangerous for us. The point of today's message is really quite simple, given to us by Christ. And here it is. God has a plan for your present and for your future. It doesn't matter who you are this morning, who I'm talking to. God has a plan for your present and He also has a plan for your future. But you will not realize God's plan for tomorrow if you're not willing to make some necessary changes today. What you do today is going to directly affect what your tomorrow looks like. So what kind of plans are you making? And what kind of sacrifices are you willing to make? Let's see what Jesus said about it here in Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 37. Jesus is having a dialogue with the Pharisees and with the religious leaders. And look what he says to them. No one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. 
And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. I think we can see some of ourselves in that today. Let me help you understand. Number one this morning, I want to talk to you about the principle that Jesus gives us here. The principle, it was found there in verse 37. He says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Now, these words of Jesus probably seem foreign to us here this morning. They come from a Mediterranean culture of about 2,000 years ago, a much different time. Basically, wine was a staple of the Mediterranean diet for two reasons. First of all, grapes grow very well in the Mediterranean climate. And then also, number two, much of their water was not suitable to drink. And so wine presented to them a very good alternative, though drinking too much wine, of course, could lead them to intoxication, as it does still to this day. Now, the ancients used to store their freshly squeezed wine into skins. They did not have nice wine bottles, perhaps like we have in the world today, so they had wine skins. And wine skins were typically made of goat or of uh, sheep hide that had been leathered. And once the new wine was in the skins, it would begin the process of fermentation. And that's the way that they would preserve their wine. Now, wine was never put into old wineskins because the old skins could not go through the fermentation process more than once. So then, old wineskins were good for storing old wine, but old wineskins were not good for storing new wine. Now I wonder about you and I, do we ever try to put new wine into old wineskins? Well, let's think about it. All of us as individuals sometimes are guilty of this. We keep doing the same old things and expecting different results. That's like taking new wine, God's plan for you today, and trying to put that into an old wineskin. It's not going to work. Churches do this when they use the same dated old strategies to try and reach people in the 21st century that perhaps we've been using all throughout the ages. Now, you and I know that Christ never changes. The gospel never changes. The fact that every person is fully depraved and in desperate need of the Lord Jesus Christ, that never changes. But our methodologies must change. You know, the apostle Paul, depending upon where he was, that determined how it was that he tried to reach people with the gospel. If he went to the synagogue, he attempted to reach people a certain way. If he went out to the riverside where Lydia was, where people were customarily praying, he would try and reach her a different way. When he went to the Areopagus in Athens and tried to witness there, he went about it a totally different way. You and I, uh, our culture still needs the Lord Jesus Christ, but the way we bring Jesus to the culture must be relevant to where they are today. Because if it's packaged in a way that they can't understand and identify with, they'll say, well, that's not for me. That must be for somebody else. At times, all of us are reluctant to accept new customs because we are so committed to old traditions. Now, it's been said about me before that I'm an old soul, and I'll, I'll accept that. I'll take that. I have great memories of the way things used to be. Lots of things I did growing up, lots of people I knew grew up in, in, in ways of doing things. That all means a great deal to me. But we've got to be careful that in loving our tradition and the things that we've done in the past, that that does not keep us from missing what God has for us in the present and the future. I want to remind you that the Pharisees refused to place their faith in Jesus because they were more committed to their old tradition than they were the Word of God and the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So be careful about your relationship to the past. If you've got wonderful, fond memories that you think about often, that is fantastic. Always hold on to those things. But do not sacrifice your present and your future on the altar of the past. You've got to be careful. Number two, let me say to you now, not just the principle, but there is a problem presented here by Jesus. The problem in verse 37, he says the new wine will burst the wineskins and it will be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. So the main problem with storing new wine in old wineskins is that the old skins could not withstand the fermentation process more than once. 
During that process, gases would cause the old skins to expand more than once and the old skins were destroyed and the new wine that had been poured inside of them was ruined. So everything at that point was lost. Now refusing to, pa- to put away the past and to press toward the, the future that God might have in store for all of us, that can lead to some fatal consequences. When you and I are so committed to the old way of doing things, what's comfortable, what's familiar, and we refuse to make the necessary changes, that can have some terrible consequences for all of us. Do you all remember back in the day there was this little store that we would visit a lot probably back in the 90s and the late 80s on a Friday night? Some of y'all are going to remember what I'm talking about when I say blockbuster video. <laughs> you know what I found not too long ago? My old blockbuster card. Remember they would give you a card and it had a barcode on it and you would go in and when you wanted to rent a video, you would show them your card and then when you show them your card, you could pay the money, you could rent your video or your DVD or whatever the case were, and if you had any late fees, because some of y'all know that you were not good about getting those videos back on time, right? The same people who used to not rewind your tapes. We didn't like that. Blockbuster video. Uh, when, when, my, when my kids were really little and we were living in Morristown, and man, some days we were poor as Job's turkey. Have you ever been there before? But all we could afford to do was go down to Blockbuster on a Friday night and rent one or two videos, pick up a $5 pizza from Little Caesars and go home and call it a Friday night, right? I remember those times. Blockbuster Video. That was a company that was started in 1985. And man, they grew exponentially with the, with the coming out of the, the release of the VCR. And by the way, remember how much those old VCRs used to be? These kids are totally lost right now. They have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> VCRs, remember, they were like five and $600 when they came out. Thankfully, they went down later. But, you know, everybody started getting them a VCR. And so then we could go to the video store and we could rent us a tape. And we come back to the house. And man, through that process, blockbuster videos all over the nation, internationally, They begin to just explode. Do you know at one time when Blockbuster Video was at their peak, they had 9,049 stores internationally. Over 9,000. Do you know that right now, today, January 1st, 2023, there is one Blockbuster store left. It's in a little town called Bend, Oregon. And you can go visit it today. A documentary has been released, by the way, on a platform called Netflix about the last blockbuster. Have you seen that? That's incredibly ironic. Do you know why? Because several years ago, some creators of a new concept, a new movie platform came to the leadership of Blockbuster and said, hey, we've got this new idea. We think that eventually videos and DVDs and cassettes are all going to go the way of all flesh. And so we really think that you ought to look into this streaming concept of movies that we've got. And the folks at Blockbuster, they looked at that, they laughed at that, and they went their merry way. That little company that they could have bought into was Netflix. And now Netflix has millions and millions of subscribers all over the world. See, Blockbuster, they missed their future because they were so fixated on the way that they had always done things. And they thought the way that they had always done things was going to be perfectly fine and see them into their future. Listen to me when I tell you this. Problems for you will abound. In 2023, if you are not willing to face the present and change the trajectory of your future, no matter where you are right now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your life is like right now, whatever course, whatever trajectory you're on, you can change that beginning today, beginning right now. And now is the time, by the way, to make those changes. You and I can't keep going to the same places, saying the same things, doing the same things, missing time, wasting opportunities. The time for that has passed. Remember Jesus said in John chapter 9, verse 4, He said, I must work the works of Him who sent me because the night is coming when no man can work. 
We, we need to feel the urgency of the moment. Christ and his ministry felt the urgency of the moment. So that's why he tirelessly worked day after day after day seeking to reach people with the truth of Almighty God. I believe with all of my heart that you and I are in the 11th hour of the human experience. In this world as it is right now, the signs of the times are everywhere. The technology exists. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but it won't be too much longer till Antichrist can rise to the surface. And when he does, we already see the globalization of everything. What do you think the Antichrist is going to take over when he implements a one world order into this world? All the technology that currently exists, all of the governments, all the people, all the leaders bowing down and worshiping Antichrist and the day is coming, I believe, very soon. And so we don't have much time left, not only to get our hearts right with God, but to get about the Father's business and start reaching other people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus and making disciples, beginning with our families, by the way. Does everybody in your family trust in Christ? Does everybody in your extended family trust in Christ? Maybe you've had opportunities this holiday season to mention to them the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you taken advantage of that? We don't have much time left. Whatever you're going to be, whatever is going to become of you, the only person you have to blame for what you become in the future is the person you looked at in the mirror this morning. You are in charge of who you become and what you do. And that's what Christ here, I believe, wants us to understand. Look at this, number three. We talked about the problem, but thanks be to God, with every problem, there is a prescription here for us from the great physician. Verse 38, what's the prescription? He says new wine must be put into new wineskins. So Jesus here gives us a very simple point. You can't take new wine and put it into the old. You've got to take the new and put it into the new. That's the way this works. That way, the wine can continue to ferment. The skins will continue to expand. And the wine and the skins are both saved. That's the principle. That's the prescription. Put the new into the new. Remember that guy several years ago. I know he got in lots of trouble for doing some reprehensible things. But there was a guy named Jared Fogel. Does that name ring a bell to you? He was the subway guy. And the subway guy was several hundred pounds overweight. You could see his old pictures. And he got tired of being that way. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to change my diet. I'm just going to change my nutrition. I probably don't have the ability to do a whole lot of exercise, but I can just start where I am and I'll just change my nutrition. So I think the story was he lived upstairs from where there was a subway below him down in the basement of his apartment complex area. And so he said, I'm just going to give up all this bad food that I'm eating right now. And I'm going to exchange that for a couple of low-calorie foot-long subs every day. He did that over a course of months. And the reason that he became the face of Subway before the things that he did, and now in federal prison, is because in just a few months, he lost about 200 pounds. He decided, I don't want to be like this anymore. I don't want to be this size anymore. And so I'm going to change something. He did something that he'd never done so that he could accomplish something perhaps that he had never accomplished. And I would say the same holds true for you and I as well. If you and I want to accomplish what we have never accomplished, then beginning today, we perhaps have to do what we've never done. What would you be willing to do? What would you be willing to sacrifice in the new year? I want you to think especially about your walk with God. You know, I can ask you this and you can answer this inside yourself right now. What's your relationship with God like right now? What's it like January 1st, 2023? Did you cruise through 2022 going through the motions? Coming to church maybe once or twice a week, once or twice every other week or month. Giving to the work of the Lord sporadically. Maybe once in a blue moon attempting to witness to somebody about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was your life like with God in 2022? And what today is the current status 
of your relationship with God? What do you think that putting new wine into new wineskins would look like for you in your relationship with God over the coming year? What if you determined in 2023 that you were going to draw closer to God? And I'm not just talking about something that you say and agreeing, oh, that sounds nice, I'd like to be closer to God. I'm talking about being intentional about it. I want to ask you this morning, sir or ma'am, what is your plan for spending time every day alone with God in 2023? What's your plan? I'm talking about getting down to the nitty gritty. Now, because if you've got, if you and I have something that really means something to us, if we've got a favorite team that we love to watch, man, we'll do whatever it takes to clear our schedule and make the time and get there and watch the game. I mean, if it's important to us, we'll do it. Ask yourself, what time of day do you plan to spend with the Lord every day? How long are you going to allot yourself to spend time with God? Is there a room in your house where you're going to spend that time with the Lord? Is there a place perhaps where you work where you can get alone by yourself and in a closet or a room by yourself and you get alone with God? What's your plan in 2023 for getting alone with God? Does it include praying, spending time, hours in prayer with the Lord, I hope? You know, you don't have to spend hours of of time in prayer every day with God. And you don't just have to be in the prayer closet or in the house To spend time in prayer, you can pray throughout your day, but there ought to be at least one intentional time where we come away from everything in the course of the day to get alone with God. And let me be honest with us this morning. The reason for some of us 2022 didn't go exactly as we had hoped or planned is because we didn't prioritize our relationship with God. That's why. It begins with prayer. Do you know how to pray? Would you like somebody to coach you on how to pray? please reach out to a brother or sister in Christ. Reach out to me. Reach out to some of the the men, the women in our church who are seasoned followers of Christ. We'll help you. We'll come alongside you. If you want some insight into how you can pray perhaps more consistently and effectively. What about Bible study? What plan do you have for Bible study in the coming year? I know this. If you don't have a plan, you won't do it. Are you still with me? If you don't have a plan, you won't do it. My buddy Ron Rejo, I had to take Nicholas and Caitlin. Thank you all, by the way, for your support and loving them and coming and being a part of their wedding the other night. That was so special to all of us. And then early yesterday morning, my wife and I got up and we took them to the airport so they could spend some time uh, together on their honeymoon. And about that time, we, we dropped them off. I got back home. It was early, about six or seven, something like that. And I was just sitting there. I was... I was about to go back to sleep and my buddy Ron Rejo sent me a text and he said, Preacher, today, if it's possible, I'd like to get 10 of your devotional guides from you. I said, sure, I can do that. I can, you want me to meet you? I can bring them to you. So I brought him the devotionals yesterday. And you know what he said to me? Here's what he's been doing over the course of the year, by the way. Here's what I wanted you to hear. Often, usually weekly, he sends me pictures of pages in that devotional guide that he's read. Almost every day, he would read that devotion. He would underline portions of that devotion. He would take pictures of that devotional page and he would share that on his Facebook wall so that other people could hear the truth and be exposed to Christ. And usually, he would, every, every so often, he would send me pictures of what he'd been reading and what that meant to him. I took him those devotional guides yesterday and I said, Ron, what are you going to do with these? He said, well... I plan to give these to people that I want to encourage to get in the Word of God every day. He said, I work with people. Do y'all work with people who need to be encouraged to get in the Word of God? He said, I work with people. I'm around people who need to be encouraged to get into the Word of God. So I want to take these and give these to these folks and just encourage them to spend time with Christ. He told me that he's got one or two devotions that he did throughout the entire every day of 2022, and that was his time that he spent with the Lord. He had a plan, and he worked the plan. What plan do you have? Or perhaps maybe in 2023, you want to get into better physical condition. Many people make those resolutions. In fact, I think that's the number one resolution when people come to a New Year, want to get in better shape, want to, want to exercise more, want to have better nutrition. You know, I don't know if you've noticed, but we kind of come to the Christmas season and my wife and I, we were sitting down the other day, we were watching TV and 
You know, you come through the Christmas season and it's cakes and it's cookies and it's food and it's restaurants and it's all this stuff you're bombarded with. And as soon as Christmas is over, December 25th, boom, December 26th, every weight loss commercial in the history of mankind comes on the next day. It's like, you guys must hate us because you encourage us to eat all this good food and go to these nice restaurants and do all this stuff. And then boom, after you help get us in this shape, you're like, hey, it's time to get, it's all I'm saying to you is there's a million plans out there, all sorts of things that you can do. And I bet you and I all know those nutrition plans, those exercise plans, whatever they might be, we know from personal experience that they work, right? The plan works if you work the plan. And that's where the water hits the wheel. Because sometimes it's a little too much like work, right? Or what if we said in the year 2023, I want to be a better soul winner. I want to be more consistent about reaching people with the gospel of my Savior, Jesus Christ. My buddy Don Hughes, who's sitting right down here today, he texted me yesterday. He said, Preacher, I've got an idea. Maybe we could throw this out there to everybody. I said, hit me with it. He said, I think that maybe what all of us should do is come up with a number of people that we would like to attempt to witness to over the course of the coming year. Now, Don probably would not mind me saying this because you all know that Don tries to help us, encourage us, lead the way in trying to share the gospel of, of Christ with people who need to hear it. He said, my number for the coming year is 365. I want to, God is my help and my witness, try to witness to one person a day for every day of the year. Now, let me caution you. When you have a plan, when you're trying to get things rolling in the right direction, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew. Now, frankly, every one of us that are followers of Jesus probably ought to be witnessing to at least one person a day. Really, we should. Because let's be honest, there's more lost people out there than there's ever been. You work with them, you go to school with them, they're in your family, they're your friends, they're your loved ones. There's more lost people than there's ever been. So really all of us should be able to do 365 over the course of the coming year. But if you've never done hardly one or two over the course of a year, then I make a suggestion to you. Start small. What if you said, sir or ma'am, I'm going to intentionally try to witness to one person a week, one a week in the coming year. That means by the end of the year, you would have witnessed to 52 people. Let me ask you something. Did you witness to 52 people this past year? Probably many of us didn't. You got to have a plan. You got to start somewhere. I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody today. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. What I'm trying to say to you is that you know God says has something more for you. And you know that you want what God has for you. But as of yet, perhaps we've not made the plan and we've not truly committed ourselves to the plan. So what if you did that? What if you said, you know what, I'm going to write down that number and then I'm going to tell my spouse, I'm going to tell my friends or my loved ones, and I'm going to ask them to hold me accountable. We don't like accountability because sometimes those who hold us accountable, they have to ask us those hard questions. What are your goals? What are your goals? And can you recruit some other people to help you to fulfill those goals in the coming year? Number four, let me talk to you now about the product. What is the product? What is the result of this new wine and new wineskins. Well, Jesus says it there in verse 38. He says, when we do it the right way, both are preserved. The wine and the wineskins are both preserved. Dramatically different results. The wine is not lost and the wineskins are not ruined. Both preserved and everybody is blessed. I've just been kind of laying out a few things for you. And there's no way on a Sunday morning, me standing up here, I can make an exhaustive list. There's probably no way I can touch every single thing that you've got in mind, perhaps, that you want to do for the coming year. But you've got those things in your heart and your mind right now, things that you believe that God would have you to, to do, the person that God would have you to become. What if you truly dedicated yourself to that in the coming year? What if you truly, with discipline and dedication and perseverance, dedicated yourself to that every day. You know what you'd find? From January the 1st, 2023 to January the 1st, 2024, you will be a drastically different person. 
You'll be a better spouse. You'll be a better child. You'll be a better parent. You'll be a better employee. You'll be a better neighbor. You'll be a better student if you will truly make that plan and dedicate yourself to that plan and trust and pursue the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit every day. You'll become a drastically different person. And it encourages us sometimes. I talk to you about all those TV spots that are on there right now. Those are, those are more physical transformations that they're showing, but it's encouraging to know that perhaps maybe if somebody is in the same boat that I am in, they took action, and now look at the transformation that's been made in that person's life. It encourages us to know it's possible, and it's possible for all of us. No matter what God wants you to do, whatever He wants you to be, it's possible for you to become that. It is. That would be the result for you, but I want you to think about this. What would the result be for the people around you? How much better would it be for the people around you in 2023 if you dedicated yourself to becoming the person that God would have you to be over the course of this year? It'd be different for your spouse. It'd be different for your kids. It'd be different for your parents. It'd be different from everybody around you. Everybody around you would be blessed because of the transformation that's taken place in your life. I just want you to see that this, this being changed and putting this new wine into new wineskins, it's not just about me and you. It's about everybody that we've got around us. When you see people that are loving the Lord and they're pursuing Christ and they're on, on fire for Jesus, it's not just good for them. And boy, it is really good for them. You can tell it's really good for them. But you can tell that they're touching every single person around them. I talked about going and seeing Ron yesterday and delivering him those devotions. I actually got to walk into his workplace and I brought them into the room where he was working with his coworkers. And I can just tell, I could just tell by walking in the room and talking to his coworkers that there is a follower of Jesus who works here. Because it's already affecting the way that these other people are now talking to me. It's amazing. The effect that you could have on other people if you would simply dedicate yourself with accountability and integrity every day to be the person that God's called you to be. Number five, and finally, let me talk to you now about the precedent. Verse 39, in the natural reading of this, a lot of us might say, well, you could have just cut it off at verse 38, but man, there is something impactful for us here that you and I need to understand in verse 39. After providing this very clear and simple explanation of the old and the new, Jesus in verse 39 felt the need to give us one final caveat, one little word of caution. Here's what he said. He said, no one embraces the new immediately. What did he say? No one having drunk the old wine immediately desires the new because he says the old is better. Why in the past have we tried to take new wine, God's plan for us today, and pour it back into the same old wineskins that we've gone to over and over and over again? It's because the old is familiar. And the familiar is comfortable. And being comfortable is convenient. And let's be honest. None of us really wants to be inconvenienced. Well, you know, you've got to be inconvenienced if you want to be transformed for the glory of God. I mean, shaking off the familiar, shaking off the comfortable, forsaking the old and pressing into the new, it's work. It's work. It's easier to sit on the couch than to go to the gym, right? You ever had that voice inside you say, get up? I, I know, I, I got some witnesses out there, amen? amen? I know I need to get up right now. But man, this bed feels really good. This lazy boy is very comfortable right now. I think I'll just get that tomorrow. And after you say that for about two weeks, it's easier to sit there, right? It's easier just to enjoy junk food than to practice healthy, good Nutrition, we know that we're in a world, by the way, our world is not conducive to you and me becoming who God wants us to be, by the way. There's temptation everywhere. 
Every single street corner, there's junk food available to us. Every convenience store, every gas station that you walk into. It's easier to be selfish, by the way, than fixing a relationship that's broken. Some of what I've said has had to do with the physical, but what about the relational? You got a broken relationship with somebody? You got a broken relationship with a parent, with a child, with a co-worker, with a church member? Is there a broken relationship that needs to be repaired? It's much easier just to say, forget it, than to try and make a phone call and have a conversation and experience some reconciliation. That's, that takes work. It's easier to keep on drinking, smoking, doing drugs. You know why? Because old habits are hard to break. It's work. Our sister in Christ, Miss Connie Holder, she said to us in a video testimony a month or two ago that she had battled with an alcohol addiction for 35 years. But by the power of God, in December of 2020, she was set free by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when I say she was set free, God set her free. God delivered her from that addiction. But here's what she had to do. She had to quit going to the package store. Amen? Maybe you need to quit walking down the alcohol aisle. Stay away from those cigarettes. If you know there's somebody that deals in substances, you remove that person totally from your life. I'm going to give you a principle for the new year. The Bible says in Romans 16, give yourself, make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. Here's what I interpret that to mean. If you give yourself a chance to sin, you will. If you give yourself a chance to sin, you will. So just don't give yourself the opportunity. Some things need to be cut out of our life. Not only do individuals yearn for the way things used to be, doing things the old way, the familiar way, the comfortable way. But sometimes, you know, churches get lulled into a state of complacency and doing what we've always done and perhaps maybe expecting a different result from that. You know that these people who watch trends in church life and denominational life, they tell us that this year, probably in America, between 6,000 and 10,000 churches will close their doors, never to reopen again. That means that somewhere probably around about 200 churches a week are going to be closing their doors. Why is that? Why would churches that once preached the gospel and saw the waters of baptism stirring, churches that used to be a focal point in the community, how could it be that a church that perhaps has existed for 50 years, 75, 100, 125 years would now be closing its doors. It's because most of them, those that are left in those churches, are happy to sacrifice the future on the altar of the past. Not too long ago, I walked into a church I was praying with them and trying to help them a little bit. And when I walked around and looked at the church, I felt like I had stepped into a time warp. Isn't it sad that sometimes churches, instead of feeling like soul winning stations, disciple making stations, places where families and people can find hope in Jesus Christ. Sometimes when you walk through the doors of their buildings, it feels more like a museum than a place where people are being set free by Christ. I mean, I literally felt like I had taken a step back in time. Even talk with some of the church's leadership about what desperately needed to be done in order for the church to continue to survive. But sometimes... The folks in those places, they may not say it like this, but what they actually mean is if surviving means that we've got to change, well, buddy, we'd rather just stay how we are and die. Is that how you feel personally? 
If me becoming the person I need to become means that I need to change, well then perhaps I just want to stay the way I am and just begin the slow process of dying physically, emotionally, spiritually. Is that really how we feel? Or do we believe perhaps God has something more for us? You know, as it pertains to churches, by the way, while I'm on this subject, you know things that get said in churches that are dying? We've never done it that way before. Keep saying that. Keep saying that. You know what? It was good enough for my parents and my grandparents, so it's good enough for us. Keep saying that. Keep saying that. I'm so grateful that I pastor a church that's multi-generational. One of the things I love about the church that I pastor is that you guys really do seem to be interested in doing whatever it takes in every facet of our church's life, whether it be with our facilities or ministries or programs or staff or resources or whatever, you really do seem to be interested in doing whatever it takes to make certain that we're reaching every generation with the gospel of Christ. I had, I had a lady who came to me after the Christmas Eve service, and I guess her child had gotten a little rowdy during the service. And she said to me at the close of the service, I'm so sorry, my son got a little rowdy in the service. I said, ma'am, you don't have to apologize to me about anything. If I ever pastor a church where I don't hear the sound of children crying and going through the facility and running around and putting their hands on the wall, I'm going to be a very sad pastor. Jesus loved those kids. When the disciples tried to keep the kids away, Jesus said, you let the little children come to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. What's it going to take for us, folks? In order to be who we want to be, we've got to make those changes. We've got to do what we've never done if we want to be who we've never been. As individuals, we need to seek counsel from the Lord. We need to make our plans and please make a plan. And then discipline yourself with perseverance and accountability to fulfill that plan over the course of the coming year. As families, our families individually, we need to talk about our common goals and dreams and we need to encourage one another and we need to hold one another accountable as, as we press forward to what we feel like God has for us as a family over the course of the coming year. And as a church, as this church, as Black Oak Heights Baptist Church, we almost, almost averaged one baptism per week in 2022. We saw 50 people walk through the waters of baptism in 2022. And I give God all the praise and all the glory for that. That means that those 50 folks prayerfully by the, the power and the grace of God have been set on a path of repentance. But our hearts should be even more desperate to see more and more people come to faith in Christ over the coming year. If we saw 50 people come to Christ and go through the waters of baptism in 2022, we ought to set a goal for 100 for 2023. And you know what? If we'll all be effective soul winners and do what Brother Don was telling us to do and make a number and say to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to witness to at least one person a week over the course of the coming year, I guarantee you we'll not baptize 100, we'll baptize 200. But every single Christian has to take seriously the responsibility of making disciples until Jesus comes back. Let me read this to you. The words of the Apostle Paul say this in Philippians 3. If you've, never, if you've never heard this, if you've never underlined this or underscored this in your Bible, boy, I encourage you to do it. An appropriate passage for today. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Paul says, One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And by the way, for the Apostle Paul, that was a lot of baggage. You got any baggage? Anybody got any baggage here today? Anybody got any emotional baggage? We don't even have enough time to get into all that today, do we? You got any baggage or some bad memories? You got any, anybody got any regrets? Let me just ask it like this. Anybody in the room today who doesn't have a single regret about something that happened in 2022, let us raise your hand because we want to congratulate you today, sir or ma'am. Nobody? 
You mean we all made mistakes? You mean we all fell short? You need to address your mistakes. You need to confess your sins to God. You need to acknowledge that you've fallen short. And then you need to put it behind you. The Bible says when God forgives us, He separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. You confess your sin to God. You ask God to forgive you. Guess what God did? He put it in the past. And let me tell you, sir, ma'am, the devil will hold you hostage over your past. Don't let him get a victory over you about regrets of things that you did not do or should have done in your past or you wish you could go back and do differently. The devil is a master of defeating you by reminding you of your past. The old preacher said it well, when the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. And that should be enough to send him on his way. The Bible says if you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Forgetting those things that are behind, that's your relationship to the past. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, that's present, that's today. Are you straining forward? Are you reaching forward? Are you making a plan? Are you seeking the help of accountability partners and others who can help you in this process? See, that's the present. Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So you've got a relationship to the past. You've got a relationship to the present. And you've got a relationship to the future. And what you do right now, what you do today, affects every single one of those. Who do you want to be in 2023? Who do you want to be in 2023?